It is officially tax season and you, just like I, have been enjoying these profits with Bitcoin and other altcoins all year long. So guess what time it is? It's time to pay Uncle Sam what I guess we have to pay him for living here, right? In today's video, we speak to a crypto tax professional, CPA, my man Vic, who I ask all the questions that you guys are probably wondering about when it comes to crypto and taxes. So grab your popcorn, your notepad, and drink of choice now because you will want to stick around for this entire video. Hey, what's up? Jay here and welcome to Bitcoin Daily, bringing you guys the best tips, tutorials, and ideas to help you guys become profitable and successful investors. The goal of this channel is to empower you with the knowledge and resources to put it all together and take you up to that next level. So if you guys are new here, make sure to subscribe guys, make sure to smash that like button and turn on the notification bell. In today's video, we're going to be talking about crypto taxes. I've gathered up all your questions and we're going to bombard our man Vic, who is a crypto tax pro. He is a CPA and he has all the answers that we are looking for. So let's jump right in. Alrighty guys. So finally, after some time, you guys know that I've been looking for someone to answer your tax questions, your crypto tax questions for a while now. So I brought my friend here, Vic, who is a very well known crypto CPA, and he is going to be the professional today that's going to help all of us uh, answering some questions. So what's up, Vic? How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm okay. doing amazing, man. I'm doing amazing. I'm very happy to finally uh, have you uh, on here, man. I've been probably for like the last two months, I've been looking for someone to get on with me, on a call with me uh, hmm. to answer these questions because a lot of people are lost in this space. Right, right. Yes, yeah, they man. are. Yeah, man. So um, give us a little bit of your background and a little introduction on, you know, uh, what you do, how long you've been doing it and all that. Sure. I've been a CPA for about 10 years now. I uh, started my career at a mid-sized CPA firm. I have my master's in taxation. I have an, under, under, have an undergrad in accounting. I worked at Ernst & Young in the, hedge fund taxation, in the hedge fund taxation space for a few years. And I started my own practice uh, in 2016, right around the bull market. It just started going off. The reason why I got into crypto taxation was because when I was working at Ernst & Young, I was in the hedge fund taxation space. So I was looking to translate that into my own practice and I was looking to get my own hedge fund clients and trading clients. And crypto just kind of fell on my lap at the time because around 2017 into 2018, that's when the bull market really took off. In the beginning of 2018, a few of my clients started coming up to me asking about like kind exchanges, how crypto is taxed. And at the at that time, crypto taxation was a fairly new topic. Right. Although it's been required to be reported to the IRS, uh, no one's really reported it because it wasn't as enforced. Right. Uh, but it started getting a lot of mainstream and you know then it started then i was getting hit left and right we started doing seminars we started reaching out to folks we started networking a lot so we got uh we got a lot of clients in that space uh so we grew and grew and grew out as a firm now we have um several hundred clients in the crypto space uh we help a lot of individual individuals we use crypto we help out crypto hedge funds we help out we help out blockchain companies who did it who maybe did a raise we also have a lot of many traditional businesses and individual clients so we're able to kind of calculate how the crypto piece molds into their other taxation and finances right uh, people may be selling real estate and stocks and those are all capital gains such as cryptocurrency so right. we're able to kind of mesh those two together and provide consulting on on tax planning okay awesome man awesome yeah man so it sounds like you really uh really been around the the whole crypto taxes and all that uh for for a while now so i'm super excited that i got you on here so what i'm gonna do i asked my followers you know what questions they had about taxes mm -hmm. and you know i'm basically just gonna kind of send these same questions to you so that you could answer them uh for us do people have to disclose their holdings of crypto and do they have to pay taxes on the crypto they have to disclose whether they have traded crypto or hold crypto mm -hmm. um, but merely holding crypto is not a taxable event mm -hmm. 
um, they only have to pay taxes if and when they trade into other cryptocurrency or trade into fiat. So, so basically, whenever they cash out, and this is also another question: when cashing out, you know, you know how there's stable coins in the crypto market that's pegged to the U.S. dollar. So, for right. example, if someone sells Bitcoin to a stable coin, is that a taxable event? Yes, that is. Okay. So it doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter. You're saying it doesn't matter which coin they trade into. If if they make a transaction from one coin to another coin, each time they make that transaction, it is a taxable event. Any any transaction into another coin, and vice versa, from a coin back into Ethereum or Bitcoin, that's those are all taxable events. Okay, so it's not only a taxable event if they cash out into their bank account, let's say. Correct. It's not. That's a misconception. Uh, many people think it's just taxable event when they cash out into crypto, but it's not. It's uh, any any trade any trade whatsoever. Any anything besides a purchase. The only thing that's not taxable, quite frankly, is a purchase into cryptocurrency. Right. So many people use Coinbase, Gemini, as their initial deposit into right. initial deposit into cryptocurrency world. But yeah, anything after that is pretty much taxable. Okay. Okay, so yeah, that that definitely I'm, I know that's definitely going to answer a lot of the questions that we get uh, because we get that question all the time. I always see that question. So then what's the difference now um, for because uh, I know there's a difference between short term trading as far as taxes and long term holding for people that are that are hodling hold, holding, you know. So what's the difference in taxes when it comes to those two different things? Well, the tax rate as um the tax rate on the short term is ordinary ordinary rates. The, sh the tax rates, uh, which which can range from anywhere from 15 to 35 percent. The tax rate on the long term is typically either zero, 15, or 20 percent. Most people are paying 15 percent. Now, the qualifications are it's the qualifications are really simple, and it's a lot of people know this already, so I may not be saying anything new. But for people who don't know it, this is news for them. If you're holding a certain position for more than one year, that is a long term. Sorry, more than one year, the loss of long term capital gain right. is 15 percent. Anything less than a year is short term. Now, a lot of people know that already. Right. What some people don't know is you're able to kind of pick and choose whether you want to use long term or short term on a certain position. For example, if you bought Bitcoin in 2013 and then you bought another position in 2015 and then you bought another position recently in 2020 and the end of 2020 during the bull run. Now, if you make a trade in, in a few months from now, you have you have different positions where you purchase Bitcoin. Now, if you use a LIFO, which is last in first out, you're going to pay short term capital gain rates because you're going to be liquidating something that you bought within a year, which was end of 2020. But if you're using FIFO, then now you're using the position you bought back in 2013, which most likely was a much lower cost basis. So you kind of have to do some tax planning around that. Now, it's, it, as you know, in that scenario, more likely than not, if you use FIFO, you will you, you'll pay less tax because you're gonna you're gonna deal with long term capital gains versus short term. Mm -hmm. But your cost basis is much less, most likely, because back in 2013, I don't even think crypto was around 2013, so that might be a bad example. But but the cost basis was more, was much less in 2013. Right. So that's where tax planning and strategy strategic comes into play on on whether you should you should use short term or, or long term. And there's other there's other there's other uh, methods you can use. You can use specific identification, which is literally choosing. You don't have to use LIFO or FIFO. It's always best to be consistent mm -hmm. from year to year. Uh, otherwise, you can get audited from the IRS. Mm -hmm. um, you're trying to beat an audit within the IRS. You may have to hire CPAs and tax attorneys. That can get very costly. So you might you. So specific identification is a method where you can use specific lots you don't have to use life or five or you can say hey i want to use this position for this for this sale and whatnot so that can all you can pretty much alter in and out of life or five uh short term and long term in the same year so how do you how do you choose like which one you're selling do you have to sell like the exact amount that you bought like in for example 2013 so that you can you know what i mean like if you bought back in 2013 and you bought let's say in the last 12 months how is it that you know how do you know which one to do you know what i mean yes um well you should be or your accountant should be using a software mm -hmm. of some sort to kind of track your crypto 
taxable events. There's okay. many out there. There's one. There's some. Better, there's a, there are some better than others. Okay. So what you do is you you will use a software. You can use Excel if you really want to be old school. But we recommend using software. The software should should plug into your exchanges and wallets. It the software depending on the it really depends on the software that you're using right. and how robust you can do this because. Trying to do this on paper is almost impossible, right. unless you're unless you only have a couple of positions, then it's right, easy. Right, right. But if you're a trader, or if you're trading amongst different exchanges, it's almost impossible to kind of do it manually on an right. Excel sheet. So the software, you, if you have a sophisticated sophisticated software, you can use, you can leverage the software to determine whether you want to use specific identification, LIFO, FIFO, HIFO, which is highest in first out, and there's LIFO, which is lowest in first out. Got you. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Is there any specific software that you recommend? You know, we typically, we have a wholesale account with Cointracking.info. We also like Cointracker. Those are, those are the top two that I like. There is also Bitcoin.tax. You know, they, they all have their ups and downs, you know, but typically, yeah, okay. I think Cointracking.info and Cointracker are probably the most well-known ones. And the good thing about using a well-known software like that is, you know, it kind of, in case you do get an audit from the IRS, you know, at least at least one can say, "Hey, I use a, a software to help me out. Right. Here's all the proof that I used. I do I did all my due diligence." Right. And then they do they do a decent job in kind of having an audit log on what okay. you did, perhaps. Okay. And so, what are the what are the odds that you're gonna get audited by the IRS? It, it's tough. It's a t it's a tough question because we have clients who got a 1089 from Coinbase, Gemini for obscene amount of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, one client got a 1089 for like north of $300,000. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in to him, it was ridiculous because he never he never made that much money. Right. What Coinbase or Coinbase or Gemini, whoever gave him that 1089 was doing was they were taking the gross proceeds on any trade or sale and treating that as a taxable event. For example, if he if he had taken $10,000 of Bitcoin, and traded it for Ethereum, the the gain on that sale might have might have only been a thousand dollars, but because of the gross the gross the gross sale was ten thousand right. dollars, Coinbase gave him a ten eighty nine for the gross sale. Wow, ten thousand yeah. dollars. So it was completely completely unfair. I mean, that happened many times, wow. one too many times, and uh, that's out of anyone's control. That so the client didn't do anything wrong to trigger that audit. Uh, that was I think that was a mistake on Coinbase's end, Gemini's end. And it's a little inconsiderate on their end to give a 1099 to someone for that amount when they know when they know for sure it's not even accurate. And then now they're creating a mess for that individual with the IRS because if the IRS deems it to be correct, which it could do because they have to fight it in court, right? You're subject to those taxes. Got now you. the chances the chances of getting audited could happen. You know, it all depends on how much you report and they report accurately. You know, most right. of my clients, uh, we report every. You know, we we recommend to report everything because. The chances of an audit could happen, you know, if if for some reason Gemini does give a 1089 and you're not you're not aware of it and you you didn't you didn't report Gemini in your tax return, right? That could that could lead to an audit. So you know, we always we always tell clients make sure you're reporting everything because even though IRS is not up to speed on every exchange and wallet and all these decentralized exchanges, they they have a they ha they do have personnel that are specialized in cryptocurrency. Okay. So I guess I guess that leads me to the next question, which is how does the IRS track, you know, uh, people's Bitcoin or how, how is it that they find out whether or not you have Bitcoin if you don't report it? Well, that's a good question. I mean, down the line, there might be subpoenas to Binance, Coinbase to get, get records. Um, you know, if they have any suspicion at all down the line, you know, if they see bank, if they see transfers in and out of your bank account from these exchanges, that that can lead to something. You know, most most people, you know, we have some clients that just want to report one or two exchanges. They may they may they may only want to report the the U.S. exchanges like Coinbase and Gemini, but they they may not want to report like a foreign exchange like Liqui or KuCoin. And I always tell them, yeah, okay, but do you think the IRS thinks you only trade on Coinbase? If you're an active trader on Coinbase, more more likely than not, you are trading on other exchanges. So that could right. lead to an audit. How they're doing it, you know, I think they just probably have a, a task force that are assigned to this. Mm. Uh, maybe, maybe you know, Big Brother is watching somewhere right. and uh, right. able to get this data. Now, do you think if you're if you're trading larger amounts of Bitcoin and you have larger positions, you're more, you know, the odds are are higher, I guess, of you being audited versus if you're just 
you know, maybe have a thousand dollars or less? Well, if you're reporting everything, see, it all comes down to the individual. Right. Because if you, if, you, if you have large transactions, but you're reporting everything, you don't have nothing to worry about. Right. And if, but, you know, you know, if you're reporting, if you're only showing small transactions, but in reality, you have big transactions that you're not reporting, you're probably at a higher risk than someone who's report, who has larger transactions, but reporting everything. Right. So uh, my next question that I have here is um, how how do you get taxed when it comes to like staking coins or uh, earned interest? Because now there's a lot of websites now that they're offering staking and earning interest for just holding your crypto there. How does that work? That's essentially just like any interest on a bank account. Okay. That's all. So that's considered that's considered ordinary gains, ordinary, uh, ordinary like. Okay, tax. so so you would be taxed kind of like uh, dividends, holding di Correct. Getting dividends, dividends interest, in the stock yeah. market. Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Let's see what else we got here. So of course, you know, this is this is a question that um, we're gonna get. Um, are there any legal loopholes for Bitcoiners? A legal loophole, which I recommend to clients, is using something called the wash sale rule. Wash sale. Uh, rule. Wash sale. Wash sales are typically disallowed in trading stocks. A wash sale is an example. Let's just say it's December 31st and you have a large potential taxable year crypto. So let's say you're, you're mate, you're, you know, if you don't, if you don't do anything, you're going to have a half a million dollar uh, taxable gain for the year. Right. Now, let's just say you're, you're holding an altcoin that's, that, that's at a loss, but you, you believe in this altcoin. You say, hey, you know, it's December 31st. Let me sell it and buy it back in an hour because I just want to, I want to take a, it doesn't say that all coin is in the red. It's right. at a loss position. You want to take that loss on that all coin and then just buy it back in an hour. This way you'll still have position in that all coin, but you took the, the taxable loss that on, in stocks is not allowed. That's something called a watch sale rule. Mm -hmm. And that loss is typically postponed until you actually liquidate out of the, um, out of that stock. Uh, but in crypto, you're able to technically take that loss and then just buy it back. And it's treated as uh, tax, uh, two different events. Because crypto okay. is treated as uh, property; it's not treated as security or right. uh, commodities. I always, I always try to tell people to keep it simple. You know, people get confused with cryptocurrency and taxation because it's like it's an intangible. Right. I always try to tell people, hey, you know, instead of thinking of it as crypto, think of it as physical items that you can relate to. Right. This is literally treat them as cars, treat them as Lamborghinis. Right. If you trade, if you buy, if you if you buy a Lamborghini at a thousand dollars and it goes up to ten thousand dollars, and then he, and then you trade it for uh, and then you trade it for a private and then and then you trade it for ten thousand dollars worth of, of of gold, you just bought, you know, you have a nine thousand dollar taxable gain because originally right. you paid a thousand dollars for that car. Right. Now you're getting ten thousand dollars worth of gold. So it's, it's always try to tell people think of it in terms of property, right? Uh, physical property. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense, man. The next question here, I think you already uh, covered it, but um, do you have to pay any taxes if you're just holding and haven't sold? So I'm guessing that's unrealized, so you don't get taxed on that. Technically, no. If you just simply bought and hold, mm -hmm. you don't have to pay taxes on it, but you should report it on your tax return at least for 2020 that you have financial interest in cryptocurrency. Okay. And another thing is, you know, speaking about that now, if you're holding cryptocurrency. You know, I, I used to get this question a lot about FBAR, mm -hmm. which is reporting foreign assets. Uh, some people think that if you are holding cryptocurrency, say on Liqui or these decentralized exchanges that are based overseas, do you have to report that as foreign foreign assets? Because if you have liquid assets in excess of ten thousand dollars, whether it's cash, life insurance, cash value in a life insurance, or anything anything like that, you do have to report it on FBAR. Uh, so now. But being, being, but if you have a house in, in like say Colombia or whatever, right, like Europe, yeah. you don't have to report that because that's not that's not liquid assets, that's not cash. So now being that cryptocurrency is treated as property, we always tell people, hey, don't fill out F bar because it's not it's considered property. You don't have to report any other property. Right. So we keep it consistent with that. Got you. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I guess this next question just because you just touched on it a bit here. Um, so like you said on on foreign exchanges so um there's a lot of people in the u.s that are using you know vpns to trade you know on a different exchange that the that they're not technically allowed to trade on so how do you deal how, how does that work when you're doing something like that yes uh well 
from a tax standpoint, you know, you're subject to you're subject to reporting worldwide income on your tax return. So if you're if you're sitting in New York or in Miami or LA and you have a and you have a VPN in China or Korea or wherever, you're still required to report that income on, on your on your on your tax return. So you know, just because just because you're trading on a VPN, that probably gives you advantages to trade in, in another another exchange that you can't necessarily change exchange in the US, but technically that's that's still reportable income. Okay. So you just report it like, you know, whatever the same way you would report anything else. Even if you were Correct. trading here. Okay. Got you. What happens if we don't pay taxes on our crypto? Well, you're, you know, the worst case scenario, you go to jail. Mm -hmm. uh, best case scenario, no one finds out and everything in between. Right. We always advise clients to report it because you're better off reporting it and paying the tax, if anything. Now, what happens is, and especially in 2018, as everyone remembers, that was a bear market. Right. Now, if you have a lot of losses in 2018, you're better off reporting it because if you have a bull market like we have now, you can maybe offset those those losses that you incurred in 2018 against a 2020 bull market. Right. So, you know, if you don't report your taxes, you know, typically the IRS has unlimited statute of limitations to go after you. Right. Even if it's even if it's 10, 15 years until they figure all this out. Right. If they find out in 2035, hey, back in 2020, uh, Joe Schmo didn't report this decentralized exchange. And by that time, they're all they're all caught up and they're all advanced and able to figure this stuff out. There's no they can go back indefinitely and, and, and pink you. So just because they may find they may they may not find out this year or next year or even for the next five years. Right. They may find out in 20 years. And right. They can, so, OK, so so you're saying that, you know, basically, obviously, as time goes on, they're going to get better at being able to track this stuff. So so 10, 20, 30 years from now, they can look back and see that you didn't claim taxes on that and they could go after you for that is what you're saying. Technically speaking, they have there's no limited stat, there's no statute of limitations on fraud. Okay. Now if you knowingly don't if you see there's different levels to it. Right. Uh, that's the worst case scenario is where they have they can go unlimited statute of limitations. Right. There's limit there's different limits to statute of limitations with tax. Um, if you knowingly fraudulently don't report something and the IRS can confidently say that hey you knew you had a reporting requirement you didn't report it that's considered fraud because you knowingly did something that has no statute of limitations but if you accidentally omitted an exchange right by accident because you didn't know how to report it or you just totally forgot or you didn't you know whatever that that can be a little different that i think they have three or seven years of statute of limitations so, so there, there, there are different tiers so how how do they prove if you knew or you didn't know like can't anyone just say, whoops, I didn't know. That's the judge's job. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Take any I, other court case. Yeah. Okay. Let's say you have, you have crypto, but you haven't, you know, cashed out to your banks or anything like that. And, and, you know, they come to audit and you'd be like, well, yeah, I had crypto, but I forgot my private keys so I can't access it. You know? So, so what happens then? Well, you have to do your best estimate. You have to do your, use reasonable estimate. We have clients who, you know, they might have got hacked, or they might have they don't, they don't have their keys. They can't get access. The, the, the exchange was a sham. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there was a several out there which you know, like I think Bitfinex. A lot of people got scammed on Bitfinex. Right. A lot of people lost lost money and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. So, right. So, so what those have in, in those situations. Those are situations we just use, we, you know, you typically have to use your best reasonable estimate and you have to, you know, you should document that, hey, this is what I did to report this on a more uh, as accurate as I possibly can. Okay. So with that, if you got, let's say you got hacked, is that considered a loss? Yeah. It's, it's almost like it, that's, that's a great area, okay. you know, cause it's, it's very new concept. Right. I, it, we, you know, typically getting hacked is the equivalent of someone stealing your car. Right. Because it's property. Right. And if someone steals your car, you can't write that off. Right. But if someone steals your business vehicle, you can write that off. Right. I say that because in cryptocurrency, you know, cryptocurrency, you're, you're trading. It's right. They're all capital assets. Now, if someone steals a capital asset, one can maybe make an argument that that's, that's a capital loss. Right. But one can also make an argument that's a that's a theft, such as someone stealing your car or your bicycle. Right. So it's a gray area. That's that's. So if you if someone if one takes a position that it's a that, that it's a capital loss, they can offset capital gains. 
and uh, you know it goes on the schedule D eighty nine forty nine, and you you're able to write off three thousand dollars of capital losses every year, and it, it can add to that. Uh, and you can you can take those capital losses and definitely take three thousand dollars per year until you exhaust all of them. Gotcha. But if you take it as a if 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 you have a if you have an accountant or a lawyer who takes it as a position of a theft, that they just wouldn't even report it. Okay. Okay, that's definitely very, very interesting because I know that's a topic that comes up a lot um, in the crypto space. This goes for for a business or for anyone, especially now uh, with NFTs and all that going on now, you know, people getting paid for services in cryptocurrencies. So how how does taxing work if you're paid in crypto? Because it feels like it might be is it two taxable events? Cause it, is it a taxable event when it comes in and then another taxable event when you go out of out of Bitcoin into something else? How does yes. that work? It's just like any consulting gig. If someone pays you, if someone pays you in, um, in Lamborghinis, if someone gives you a Lamborghini as compensation, that's that, that Lamborghini is treated as income. Uh, and if you sell a Lamborghini at a, if you keep that Lamborghini as a capital asset in your business and you sell it at a loss or a gain, you have a taxable event. So just in crypto, if someone if someone gets paid in, in cryptocurrency, that that in itself uh, gets reported on as on a, as, as no ordinary income. And then if you you're gonna have expenses against it, you, you can expense like you know uh, electrical expense, travel, maybe you take out a client, reasonable technology expenses, et cetera, right. office supplies, you can expense against all that. And then now, and then when you sell out of that cryptocurrency, you, you will have a capital loss or a capital gain as well. So it is a two part, it is a two part event. Okay. So you get taxed when you get paid on, on whatever it is you get paid. And then from that moment on, if that goes up or down, then you're going to either have a capital gain once you sell or a loss when you sell. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just like getting it's it's like any other business. Okay. You get you get, you get paid, and then uh, you should be doing some proper bookkeeping to offset your expenses against right. it as much as you can. Right. Um, and then you you sell out of it and have a capital loss. So you get you get taxed on your net income, not just the gross income. Right. Okay. Death. Okay. So that's definitely a very interesting one there. So is there a minimum or maximum that you have to declare when dealing with cryptos, or just anything that you have? I would report anything you have. I mean. Okay. Outside of cryptocurrency, I have to double check this, but if you have, you don't have to file a tax return if you earn less than the standard deduction. So for 2020, the standard deduction, I believe is 12,600. Okay. So if you don't, if you earn less than 12,600, you don't have to file a tax return. Okay. But if, if you hold cryptocurrency, maybe you don't have to report that either, but I would report it anyways, because capital gains is a different tax bracket, right. different category than earned income. Right. Uh, you just want to be extra compliant and report it anyways. Okay. Uh, but there's no minimum or maximum. I mean, look, if you're, you're talking about a dollar, right? I mean, yeah, obviously you don't want, no one's gonna like no one's <laughs> right. happy for a dollar, right? But I think once you once you start crossing the several thousand dollars, like at least one or two thousand dollars, I would say that that's enough to start reporting it. But anything less than that, anything less than like five hundred, anything less than six hundred bucks is kind of it's technically considered negligible. Okay. Okay. But I think six hundred awesome. is is, a, is the uh, magic number. In, okay. Over six hundred dollars. Got you. So from your experience, um, how much do you think someone has to be making before they, they can start considering a, using a CPA or an accountant or, you know, a specialist in, in this field? I would say at any given point, okay. um, cause you know, you, you, cause people, people can go from investing a thousand. I've seen investments go from several thousand to end up being a couple hundred thousand dollars right. in a matter of weeks or months, right. which I'm sure you have seen it too, especially yeah. in, the alt, in the alt world. Yeah. So I would say if you're investing, you know, definitely uh, at least consult with, consult, with, consult with a CPA or an attorney or an accountant. If you know what you're doing, you can use these softwares and do it yourself. Perhaps it's like the TurboTax accounting. Right. But um, if you want sophisticated advice and someone do it for you, some people don't know what they're doing, but, uh, but some people are savvy enough to just Google it. Right. Uh, that's fine. Go for it. But I would say it's always wise to use a CPA or accountant because, you know, A, they can consult you. B, they're signing off on the tax return. C, is saving you a ton of time and you can just focus on your trading. Then we'll have to worry about the admin and taxes and the accounting. Because if you make one mistake on a tax return, which could happen, especially if you're using different exchanges and wallets and right. doing IC. We have clients who are doing ICOs, 
it can get really complex and to try to figure all that out, you know, it's, it just doesn't make sense, you know, and then you might as well just hire an accountant. Um, you know, we have clients who are W2 employees and we have clients who are self-employed and have their own businesses and right. all, all, of, all of the above. And, you know, they always reach out because they don't know what they're doing. They know how to trade, right. you know, to make a lot of money in crypto, but as far as in the, in the, it's when I enjoy that money and go, go partying, right. go for it. But then when it comes down to tax and accounting, you should you should hire a professional. This way you're you know reporting everything properly, you're getting the best tax advice, you know, you're getting that consulting as what the, whether you sh- you should use LIFO or FIFO. Right. So it can be like anything. I mean people can go and create create LLCs online and instead of using a lawyer, but then when, when push comes from sub and, and it push comes to sub and you get sued, you know, those those online platforms where you formed your, your LLC may not help you in court. Right. If you, and if, if, you, if the other, if the, if you're, if you're, if the opposite party had a lawyer who drafted their documents. So it's just like anything else, you know, if you do it yourself online, you pay for what you get. Right. It might be a little cheaper, but you hire a professional, you have the backing of a, of a CPA who knows what they're doing. Right. And w- would you say in, in your opinion that with using a, a CPA in the long term is going to save you more money than if you just try to do it yourself? Uh, it depends. It, it depends. Look, if you're just trading on one, if you're just trading on one exchange, mm-hmm. then you know you can maybe do it yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, but it depends what's going on because it's like, I, I think in the it, it's it's such it's such a taxes and, any, and like anything else, it's such a personalized topic right. that depends on the individual. Because right. if, you, if you're if you're just if all you're doing is trading and you have one exchange, yeah, you can go ahead and probably do you do it yourself. Right. But you know, if you if you have if you have if you have a job, you have you're trading stocks. If you have real estate, if you have other, if you have other businesses that you're running and you you have a lot of flow through income, and you have your consulting gigs, then I would say it's it, you know, if you try to do everything yourself, you're just gonna it's gonna be difficult to kind of manage all that. Right. Um, and you you can probably will you save more money in the long run maybe maybe not but you will save yourself time and you will you will save yourself a headache right um and time time is money time is money yeah. especially and exactly so you know at the end of the day the money you spend to do it yourself is a, it's not that much it's it could be a little it could be it's it maybe could be a fraction of what you pay a CPA right but I know if you use a, if you use those online tax softwares, of, you know I don't want to say the names just right. to protect their uh, right. trademarks and everything, and you, and you pay for these uh, uh, these crypto tax softwares, you combine those two fees, it's not it's it may, it may still be less to pay in the CPA, but if then you incorporate the time you're, you're spending right. burning your wheels, I think in the long run you are better. You just better. You, you might save. You definitely save time, and you right. know you could say you could save money in the long run because because good, good, again, if you're trading for the long term, a good CPA could set you up more properly in the beginning. Right. By advising you to use LIFO, FIFO, right. Identification. You know we if especially if you're mining, a good CPA can you know consult you on taking proper mining deductions right um if you're a full-time trader you can maybe take a home office deduction travels you may not know all that without consulting with a good cpa right got you got you okay that's... generally yes i think it always makes sense okay awesome. and in doubt you should at least have a consultation with them. right yeah for sure and, and like i said you know especially when when in the crypto space that everybody knows that you know bitcoin's main value is scarcity um i believe that time is just as scarce if not it's more scarce than bitcoin you know what i mean so um so definitely if you value your time um i i I definitely believe that you know it's money well spent as well let me see um what uh percentage should people put aside you know when they're um trading Uh, a good number is always around 20 to 25 percent okay so that's that's more or less the average that people will be paying on that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, because if you're trading short term or long term, uh, 20, 25 percent should, should put you in a good position. OK, awesome. Have enough money to set aside. Awesome. And then the last question, we've gone over all these questions. Um, the last question I have. So so lately, the, the craze is NFTs. So and, and I think people are under the assumption that if they just buy an NFT with crypto, that they don't have to pay taxes 
on that crypto. So can you clear that up for me, um, whether you're buying NFTs or selling, I guess, NFTs? Yeah, if you're buying N NFTs, you have to pay tax because any any purchase, it's like it's like any other trade. Mm -hmm. So if you buy if you bought Bitcoin at a dollar and it went up to ten dollars, and then if you buy an NFT, you buy ten dollars worth an NFT, you have a nine dollar taxable gain. Got it. And when you sell a lot of the NFT at a profit or loss into back into crypto, that's another taxable taxable Got event. It. So so it's again it's two taxable events. You you get a taxed on the purchase, and then it's also a taxable event if you sell. So right. if if you hold you know an NFT for over a year, then is, is does that change from short term to long term? Yeah, so if you buy into an NFT and you hold it for more than a year, <laughs> then that NFT per sell back into the crypto is a long term capital. Okay, game. awesome. So that's that's definitely interesting to know, especially right now with all the, the new craze with NFTs and, you know, people making money with NFTs, people buying NFTs and all that. So um, I think I pretty much touched on everything that uh, everybody was asking me, uh, the, you know, all the main questions I was getting. I think I touched on, um, you know, questions that I had myself for you. Is there anything else that you want to add on? Um, if not, um, you know, just tell us a little bit about where anyone could find you if they want to have a consultation with you. Yeah. So uh, one thing that we maybe we should have touched on is like kind exchanges. Uh, that was a very common situation. People thought trading one crypto for another is like kind exchange. But back with the, with the ta tax job cut act uh, that passed in 2018 or 2016, hmm. like kind exchanges are only applicable to real estate. So trading any cryptocurrency, people thought is a tax deferred event until you actually sell into fiat but that's the only thing that maybe people should be aware of um anyone anyone can find me uh, my website is commercecpa.com you can reach me on my cell phone number 347-640-0823 that's 347-640-0823 uh, my email address is vic b at commerce cpa that's v i c k b at commercecpa.com. Um, we're based in New York, but we have clients all over the country and all over the world. Um, we have a, we have a solid team of uh, I used to work at EY. I have other staff who are also all the big four. We have a great team of international tax, trust, estates, uh, consultants. We do audits, reviews. We we help out with SEC uh, SEC audits as well. We have clients who um, who raise money and you know. BVI or Caymans, and the SEC might have subpoenaed them right. because of, you know, back in 2017, there were many ICOs, right. so a lot of these companies are being subpoenaed. There was a lot of fraudulent going, fraudulent money moving, going around, so we, we actually have been engaged in doing forensic accounting on where those tokens were moved. You know, we're working on some, some cases right now uh, as well. So that's so we do a lot of complex complexity so we can be a great resource for anybody anyone can reach out for a consultation and um you know, happy to help out awesome man i appreciate it so much vic and and for everyone uh listening right now uh, and watching this video i'm gonna go ahead and put all his contact information in the description of this video so that you guys have access to that as well and uh so that you guys can reach out to to vic yourselves and and get a consultation yeah and one 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 more thing we've actually featured in forbes as you can see um in the background as a top crypto accounting provider awesome awesome vic thank you so much man i appreciate your time so much we, we've basically been on for for 45 minutes almost an hour i really appreciate you coming on and answering all these questions man um you know, hopefully we'll, we'll have you on again at, at some point, you know, may, maybe next year we'll do, we'll do a part two to this video. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank awesome. Vic. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Anytime. Talk to you later. Alrighty guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm very excited to have had Vic on here to answer all the questions. I wanted to make sure to get a professional for you guys um, to answer all your questions because I didn't want to give you misinformation. So if you did, make sure to smash that like button. If you guys are new here, then also make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell. Remember that we make videos Mondays through Fridays, five times a week, Mondays and Fridays, we do market analysis, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we do tutorials, reviews, interviews, 
all sorts of fun stuff. And then Wednesdays is when we do our live streams. So thank you guys for tuning in. I will see you on the next video. As always, peace and love. Oh,